one of the great transitions between childhood and adulthood is the realization that life is not fair. This is not usually a pretty process. It wasn't for me. Children generally learn this when they finally confront real evil, either in the world or in themselves, or real tragedy. This knowledge of good and evil is a real loss of innocence. The child who has come to this realization no longer expects justice. It's an important step, but it is a terrible one. For me, I was badly bullied early in life. I was a California kid moving to Southwest Missouri. From grades four through six, I learned quickly that there is evil in the world. There's evil in school children. And this was soon coupled with the scarier realization that I, too, had evil in me. And that deserved punishment, and so did they. So I had my first taste of the paradox of life is unfair. And thank God, for my sake, that it is so. But many never come to these realizations. In a way, I was lucky that I did, or was forced to. Certainly the non-religious do not come to this realization, but even the religious. The central question in almost every major world religion is, why is there suffering? But even more so, why is there unfair suffering? Personal injustice. How to deal with that is the question that all the world religions ask. The Stoics offer no answer except grin and bear it. The Hindus and the Buddhists in their own ways say that suffering is an illusion. Judaism, like Stoicism, stops at moral platitudes. Only the gospel of cross and tomb has an answer to this question. Our topic today is personal injustice, the unfairness and suffering of life. And our task is to explore what this has to do with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is such an important issue for our time. As a society, many of our actions, both political and otherwise, are motivated by an acute awareness of the injustices committed against the individual, whether real or imagined. We have a culture of victimhood, and this is light years away from the culture of the gospel and the message specifically of our epistle this morning from 1 Peter 2. So first I'm going to walk through 1 Peter 2, 19 through 25, which exhorts the Christian to suffer indignity with patience, looking at the example of Christ. Then we will look at how the resurrected Christ beckons us through the gate of personal injustice along the path of faith. So please turn in your liturgy booklet to page 9. Now our epistle reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2. There is a typo. I apologize. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 2, 19, not 2 Peter. It says, Paul starts, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now don't miss the, the shockingness of this statement. If a man suffers wrongfully, he ought to give thanks for that. With a conscience toward God, meaning mindful of God's providence over his life, he can, as Paul says, consider it joy, my brethren when bad things happen to him or people mistreat him for no good reason. Peter continues, For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? So, there are three ways to take our sufferings, or relating to our sufferings. There is the way of the perpetual victim. This one, when he is punished for his own faults, does not take it patiently, 
but turns and accuses the one giving the punishment. The second way is the normal man of virtue. This one, as Peter says, when he's buffeted for his faults, he takes it patiently. Now, Peter asks, what glory is there in that? Now, perhaps if St. Peter were to see the throngs of modern people who, armed with a victimhood mentality, constantly transfer blame to whatever and whoever they can, then he would make a comment that there is, at least, something commendable in a man or a woman who accepts with patience being punished for his or her own faults. Does that make sense? Yet Peter chooses to contrast this normal man of virtue, not with perpetual victim, but with a Christian saint. So we're very far away from where our culture is right now and what he's talking about. He says, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. This is a return to our opening sentence. God, our Christians have a different way of relating to unfairness in life. How a Christian looks at personal suffering and unjust suffering in particular is vastly different from the way that a normal virtuous man that Peter talks about sees his suffering. For while both people are able to accept just suffering for their own faults, the Christian is able to accept unjust suffering, unfair pain, unfounded embarrassment, unmerited scorn. And since life is unfair, the Christian has a different way of relating to all of life. So where does this way of accepting unjust suffering come from? Peter continues, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ opens to us the way of accepting unjust suffering. We can accept personal injustice not only because we see Jesus doing it, but because we know by the testimony of his resurrection that all personal injustices will be made whole, and then some, when we are resurrected in our new bodies with Jesus to everlasting life. This means that we are free to live a life of no expectations. I don't have to get mine. That was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> Cat likes me. <laughs> now I lost my place. I got it. I don't have to get mine through trickery or deceit. Children, when a bully makes fun of you, you don't fight back. Either with your fists or with your words. Did Jesus fight back when they were calling him names on the cross? And how did things end for him? On the third day, we say in the creed, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. So you see, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ opens the way of accepting unjust suffering. So then Peter chooses to close his epistle with an interesting statement. For ye were as sheep 
going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So close your eyes for a moment. Imagine with me a round green pasture, about 200 yards in diameter, and it's surrounded by trees. In this pasture are many sheep. It's a bit crowded, not enough grass to grow, to go around. This is the pasture of the world. Directly across from you, at the edge of this pasture, in the middle of the hedge of trees, is a thicket, very dark, ominous, full of thorns. All the sheep are scared of it. In fact, they are so afraid of it that they stand back, further crowding the already cramped pasture. One day, the shepherd comes and starts cutting through the thicket. The thorns tear open his skin. The sheep look upon their shepherd covered in blood, going where they would never dare. Finally, he cuts through the thicket and walks through the trees. All the sheep lower their heads and they can see just barely what looks like rich lush grass going on for miles. From the other side of the trees, the shepherd calls them. But even though a path has been cleared, most of the sheep are too afraid to walk through it. A few do, however, and some of the thorns surrounding the thicket cut into their skin also. The sheep in the pasture of the world see the blood. They hear the screams of the sheep who trusted their shepherd. And this confirms for them that they will never go through that thicket. Yet what they don't see is that those who followed the shepherd through the gate of unjust suffering come out on the other side into a field of infinite consolation. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You can open your eyes. If we follow Jesus through the scary gate of unfairness into the pasture of his reward and grace, then what can possibly steal our joy in this life? All the sheep in the pasture of this world are fighting over this or that blade of grass. It's my promotion, my recognition, my acquittal. I deserve this. Or I didn't do anything wrong. I worked harder. I'm righteous. I don't deserve that. Or they did this. They did that. They deserve this. They don't deserve that. <laughs> if only they knew that the pasture of the resurrected life supplies so much consolation, vindication, glory, and righteousness that the little unfairnesses of life will soon be very little remembered or seen. All that is required to enter into the life is for the sheep to trust the shepherd enough to walk through the thorny thicket of personal injustice. So today is the second Sunday after Easter. It's called Good Shepherd Sunday. Jesus as shepherd is in every single scriptural passage from this morning. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Isaiah 40, behold, the Lord will come with a strong hand. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. 1 Peter 2, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And of course, the gospel from John 10, I am the good shepherd. Our collect for today begins, Almighty God, who has given thine only Son to be unto us both a sacrifice for sin and also an ensample of godly life. A sacrifice and an example. In the same act, in his crucifixion, he clears the path that none of us could have ever cleared. He is the sacrifice. He is the life. And he is also the way, an example. I am the way, he says, follow me. This is the path. 
don't be afraid. Jesus is the good shepherd. Following the assertion of, I am the good shepherd, Jesus spends the rest of the pericope contrasting good shepherds with hirelings, men who do not actually care for the sheep and who flee at the first sight of danger and leave the sheep to the wolves. There is the good shepherd and there are good shepherds. And then there are hirelings. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, our focus is primarily upon the Good Shepherd. But it is also appropriate to think briefly on the shepherds that God provides for his flock. Now you may have noticed and wondered why bishops carry a staff with them. Every bishop calls what is, carries what is called a crozier. A crozier is a curved stick. It has a hook at the end. And this tall, sturdy staff was carried by shepherds in the past. It's a shepherd's crook. And it has two reasons for being the way that it is. First, it's a heavy thing for beating the snot out of any animal that would possibly attack the sheep. And the second is so that it can hook a sheep around the neck and gently pull the sheep back into the fold. Hence, the shepherd's crook, the curve. A bishop is to be a faithful under-shepherd. So much of the mess of Protestantism can be attributed to the fact that they have lacked the shepherds or the bishops that Jesus gave his flock. For many of us here, we are not used to having a bishop. This is new to us. We will, we will likely have both bishops Sutton and White here on one of our first Sundays inside on June 20. We must learn to follow and trust men like that. They are a gift from the Good Shepherd to us. Then there is shepherd language assigned to simple clergymen like myself and Father Josh and Deacon Kyle and Deacon Bill. We are pastors to you. Pastor is related to the word pasture. A pastor is one who is tasked to lead a flock to green pastures. I can assure you that your pastors always feel very inadequate for the task that they have. In a very real sense, we are sheep too. We trust that by the sacramental grace poured out in the sacrament of ordination, we have been supernaturally or ontologically empowered to even begin to do what in our natural sheepishness we would never do, which is to press through the thicket and to take a group of sheep with us. So I don't know what this life will hold for us, for me and for you. Perhaps there are tough times ahead. Perhaps Jesus will call us through the thorny thicket of personal injustice again and again. Maybe there is difficulty in store. But there are a few things that I know. I know that we will suffer through them together. I know that I, for one, am honored by the awesome privilege and feel the great weight to walk with you through that thicket. And I know that the Good Shepherd went through the thicket and still bears the scars in his body, and that we too will bear the marks of suffering, both just and unjust. But I also know that Jesus will feed you in a green pasture and lead you forth beside the waters of comfort. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou shalt prepare a table before me in the presence of them that trouble me. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. It is an Easter truth that from the other side of the grave comes our vindication. We walk through this life knowing that the economy of this life is not all that there is. 
the resurrection of our good shepherd proves that there is life beyond death and beyond the thorns of personal injustice. So now let us eat from the table that he has prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. That in honor or dishonor, life or death, justice or injustice, our cup shall always be full. Amen.